Open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And we've been dealing with the uh, first 23 verses. We did not get too far last week. But let's take a look at Mark chapter 7. Reading verses 1 to 3. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. That's very important. Make note of that. Holding the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat, or when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, uh, like uh, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. I don't know what couches has to do with it. I, I haven't washed my couch lately. <laughs> Maybe I ought to. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? There it is again, the tradition of the elders. Make a mental note of that or underline it. Why do they not uh, walk according to the tradition of the elders but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say... If a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is, a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. When he had called all the multitudes to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but those things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable, and he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart? but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Wow. Now, we had already covered up to verse 8, and that's all, or is about to be online. The outer is already online. But let me just go back over a couple of things real quick to set the stage for where we're getting to tonight. And one of the things that we established last week was the difference between church teaching and Bible teaching. And there's lots of churches that teach lots of different things that have got nothing to do with the Bible. And you noticed in the text, and I pointed it out to you again, is that idea of following the tradition of the elders. There are plenty of churches out there, and again, you know, they're just making an easy target to pick on. The Roman Catholic Church is great for this, uh, elevating certain doctrines of men to the same level of authority as Scripture. Well, that's a problem, because men don't have the authority of Scripture, no matter what they might think about themselves. So uh, there's a big difference between church teaching and Bible teaching. And you know what? The Bible is plenty explicit on plenty of different things, but there's plenty of things that the Bible is not explicit about. That's why we talk about there are certain things in Scripture that are explicit, and there's other things in Scripture that are implicit. You understand the difference between the two? 
Like for instance, there's nowhere in scripture that says you should not sexually molest a small child. It's nowhere in scripture. But all the wisdom of scripture will tell you that's a sin and you don't want to do that. Even though there is not a specific commandment. So there's things that are explicit, there's things that are implicit. So we look for the wisdom when things are not explicit. But one of the things about elevating the doctrines of man or the traditions, religious traditions, to the same level of authority of Scripture is two things that Jesus points out here. One is hypocrisy. Is when you practice the traditions of men as having the same level of authority of Scripture, it makes you a hypocrite. Because you're doing things that God never commanded you to do, or you're not doing things that God did command you to do for the sake of fulfilling those traditions of mankind. And, you know, honestly, in a lot of churches, really virtually every religion in the world, apart from biblical New Testament Christianity, you got to earn your way to whatever it is that they promise. So everything that they tell you to do becomes a little box that you tick, right? So you, you have to go down the list and you have to tick all the boxes to make sure that you get whatever it is that they promise. Christianity is not like that at all. What God's looking for is he's looking for a heart, a heart that loves him, a heart that, that desires to know him and, and walk with him. And as we keep saying here, as we're studying through the Gospel of Mark, a heart that's ready and willing to follow him wherever he might lead. And sometimes he's leading places that we might not necessarily want to go. He might be leading us to, to, uh, to do something that we may think, well, gee, you know, I'm not really sure I want to go there. And you know, I'm not really sure, you know, I want to move to, I mean, Idaho of all places, you know. But, <laughs> but you, know, I, you know, if the Lord wants me to go to such a God-forsaken wilderness, you know, I will. Um, uh, <laughs> it's good skiing there. All right, all right. I'll go with that. But as we've said many, many times here in this church, is the best place in the world to be is exactly where God wants you to be. And it doesn't matter where that is. You could be, uh, as we like to say, scrubbing toilets in Zimbabwe. And if that's where God wants you to be, man, oh man, that's the best place to be. Best place in the world. They, I, in some places they do. <laughs> I've never been to Zimbabwe, but I've been to Ghana. And I did manage to find a couple of toilets there. Not that you'd want to use them or anything. <laughs> now, <clears throat> you got hypocrisy. It's a big part of obeying the doctrines of men. But something else comes up as a result of practicing the doctrines of men. When man-made religion has the same level of authority as God's word, something else happens. And it's there in verse 7, in vain they worship me. Now your worship becomes vanity. The reason it becomes vanity is because you're worshiping an idea of God that really isn't true. You know, we've talked about this here before, the idea that uh, you can construct a straw God. It's a philosophical term, you know, the straw man argument. You can construct a straw God. In other words, you can in your own mind make up an idea of what you think God ought to be or who you think God is. That's what you worship. But if you are not worshiping God, listen to me, as he has revealed himself, then you're worshiping a strong God. God has revealed himself, and you and I, we don't have the right to change that. So if you want to worship God, you have to worship God as he has revealed himself. And he's revealed himself in the pages of his word and in the person of his son. That's how we know who God is. If we worship anything other than that, well, you know, I think God, hold it right there. Doesn't matter what you think. What matters is how God has revealed himself. Well, I think God is like, it doesn't matter what you think God is or what God isn't. What's important is how God has revealed himself. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to find ourselves worshiping in vain. In other words, the benefits that we derive from the worship of God would all be for nothing if we're worshiping a straw God. Does that make sense? Y'all with me. Y'all with me. All y'all with me. So, I got thinking about this, and I brought this up last week. 
One of the reasons why the doctrines of men get elevated to the same level of authority as Scripture is because men are vain, and they want it to be all about themselves. This is my tea. This is a revelation that God gave me. Look, if anybody tells you that they have a new revelation from God, run the opposite direction. There is no new revelation. There's only God's word. That's all that there is. So if somebody tells you I got a new revelation, run away. Men want it to be all about them. Let me tell you how spiritual I am. God's given me a new revelation. Baloney. So H.A. Ironside comments on this idea. And he says, to the spiritual mind, it is a question of unceasing wonder that men should be so ready to follow and even fearlessly contend for the authority of human traditions while they are just as ready to ignore the plain teachings of the Word of God. People are so quick to follow it. You know, my old pastor used to say all the time, you know, if you don't stand up for Jesus, you'll fall for anything. And people do. And even Christians, and you know, one of the great burdens of my heart is that, that Christians by and large, particularly in America, they just don't know God's word. They just don't know. So what ends up happening is we end up suffering simply because of our ignorance. We don't know what God's word says. And if we knew what God's word said, then we could apply it to our situation. Yeah, let's talk about that earlier. Problem, solution, apply it, done. You know, that's just how dudes think, you know. But if we knew, then we could say, oh, this is what God's word says, and I can apply it to my situation. Situation settles down. If I don't know what God's word says, then I just amble ignorantly on my way, suffering all the consequences of my failure to take God's word and apply it to my situation. Does that make sense? If I knew what it said, I could do it. Now, here's the problem. If you know what it says and you don't do it, You know, I, you just have to be willing to accept the consequences of the fact that you are knowingly ignoring what God's Word tells you to do or what God's Word tells you not to do. So I got thinking about this, and I closed last week with this, and then we'll finish out this section here. Is Jesus says that we got to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we want to worship God in spirit and in truth. Because there are many benefits to the worship of God for us. So in my mind, the writer we get this, the more we know about God, the more we know about his God through his word, the deeper and more meaningful our worship becomes. That makes sense? The deeper and more meaningful our worship becomes. Now, let's flip that. Look at your worship of God now. And I'm not just talking about the singing of songs. Look at your worship now. What does your worship, what does your worship, your attitude and acts of worship say about what you claim to believe? Because if our worship gets deeper and richer, the more we know about God, the more we know about his word, the more we know God through his word, what could you derive from how we worship the Lord right now? Now, I know we typically refer to the singing of songs as worship. And worship is certainly far more than that. Uh, we could probably all agree about that. But if you're like me, and I hope that you're not, but if you are, when we start our church service on Sunday morning with worship, we typically work our way through four songs. That's our liturgy. We got we get, we'll, oh, one song to open, and then three more, and then the message. If by the time I get to the end of that fourth song, I'm finally beginning to settle into an attitude of worship. Now, that's not a bad thing, because then we can continue on in that attitude of worship as we study God's Word. But see, all that tells me is that the, for the first three songs, I'm not worshiping at all. You know, I'm up here, you know, singing, oh, you know, I praise you, Lord, I praise you, Lord. Holy cow, where's the rest of the church? You know, geez, you know, everybody gets here so late. I praise you, Lord, hallelujah. You know, geez, you know, did I, oh, did I bring the right notes today? Yeah, okay, I'm good. All right, whew, man, I, you know, hallelujah, God, bless, you know, pray, man, I am, why am I so hungry? You know, I, <laughs> this is what I do. And even in the sermon, even me, I'm the one that preaching the sermon. I'm going, man, I'm hungry. What time am I going to get done? 
I'm going to cut this sermon short. I'm going to lunch. <laughs> so what does our worship say about what we claim to believe? You, you might look at our worship. We might examine our own worship and say, gee, you know, the way that I worship, not only do I not know very much, I don't really care much either. I don't really care much about God or what he says. And I certainly don't know very much. But it doesn't matter. I'm having a good time. I'm here in church with lots of other nice people and I feel very religious and you know I, I've ticked that box for the week so now I can go on and do whatever I want. That sounds kind of like a slap upside the head, doesn't it? Take it for whatever it is. So then, what is it that really defiles? That's the word, that's the word that Jesus used. Defile. What is it that really defiles you or me. That would be, if you're take, making notes, that would be point number three. The nature of defilement, and that's verses 9 to 14. And Jesus really rebukes the religious leaders of the day. Remember, these are the religious leaders. These are the, these are the guys that teach in the synagogue every single week. So all of these people that are listening to what they say and listening to what Jesus, these spiritual leaders here, the, the, all these people grew up listening to these guys in the synagogue. So this is the religion of their childhood. And these spiritual leaders are coming out to Jesus and they're saying, how come your disciples don't wash like all the rest of us. All of us do that. How come your disciples don't do it? So Jesus uses an example from the law of God regarding gifts to God. And he's referring to something uh, that you can find in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, Exodus 21, verse 17, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, and that is the law of Korban. In other words, you can dedicate certain monies in your possession to God. This money is set aside, and it's going to go to the temple. It's in my bank account, but it's set aside. It's Korban. It's set aside as a gift to God, so we're not going to touch it. No one's going to touch it. It's going to go to the temple, it's going to be a gift of God. But what Jesus points out is, they kind of twisted things around so that even somebody who had elderly parents that needed help, the kids could say, well, yeah, we've got a bunch of money, but we can't use it to help you because it's Corban. It's dedicated to God. So Jesus says, you're making people violate one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother. And you're giving them a religious out. It's dedicated to God. That money is dedicated to God. So in keeping the one, you're making them violate the other. That's hypocrisy. Now, here's the point of this. And it's in verse 12. Let's back up to verse 11. Jesus is going on and he's rebuking these religious leaders. And he's saying, but you say... If a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, here it is, verse 12, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. You no longer let him do anything. What is he saying here? If that person wants to be a member in good standing of the local synagogue, he can't give that money to his parents because he dedicated to the Lord. And the religious leaders will know. See, they no longer let him do it. You want to be a member in good standing in this church? Then you have to follow through on this tradition that we have in this church. And if you don't follow through on that, you don't get to be a member in good standing in this church. Now, there's lots of churches that do that, isn't there? Now, it's one thing to take a doctrinal position on something. You know, in this church, we take this doctrinal position on politics or on abortion or homosexuality or marriage or lying or whatever. Take your pick. We take a doctrinal position on it, and, and if you want to know what some of our doctrinal positions are, then listen to the foundation study that we're doing on Sunday morning. That'll tell you. We also have a statement of faith on our webpage and lots of other sermons on the webpage that have to do with what this church believes. So if a church leader... A religious leader comes to you and says, well, if you want to remain a member in good standing of this church, you have to keep this tradition. 
And if you go to the Word of God and say, well, you know, I'm not finding your tradition anywhere in the Word of God. Where's this tradition comes from? Well, the, the, the individuals that founded this church had this tradition, and we're keeping that tradition alive in this church. Okay, bye. What are you going to keep? Are you going to keep the doctrines of God or the traditions of men? Now, I think it's unfortunate, but I think it's true that in a lot of churches in America today, they're upending the doctrines of God for the sake of being socially aware or active or sensitive or whatever it is that they think that they want to be. And I understand why. I understand why churches are doing that. But I'd rather stand and be ridiculed on the Word of God than to be rebuked by God for standing with the doctrines of men and the traditions of the world. So if people want to say, well, gee, you're this or you're that because you're, you know, one of those radical right-wing fundamentalist bomb-throwing, hating, Christian, born-again people, you know, it's like, oh, sure, you know, <laughs> call me whatever you want. Uh, you know, I'm going I'm to stand on the Word of God, and that's okay with me. I don't mind that because I figure if I'm standing with God, then, you know, when everybody else has fallen, I'm going to be okay. And I just figure that's the safest place to be. Rejecting God's word so that you can cling to a man-made tradition is not only foolish, but it leads to defilement. It leads to defilement. Now, when religious leaders tell you what you can and cannot do based on man's tradition, not based upon the word of God, and if you have any questions about what we believe in this church or what we stand on a particular issue, feel free to ask. I'd be more than happy to explain to you as best as I can our doctrinal positions on anything that you want, any time that you want, anything that you want. No boundaries, nothing's off limits. Talk to me about anything. But when a religious leader, a church leader, tells you what you can and cannot do, based on the traditions of that church, that is called oppression by religious hierarchy. Oppression by religious hierarchy. You want to be a member of this church, this is what you got to do. You want to be remain a member in good standing of this church, this is what you got to do. Now Jesus has much to say about oppression by religious hierarchy. And he says so in Matthew chapter 23. And I got to tell you, um, it's not real nice. Uh, you know, we like to think of Jesus as being the most polite and humble man that ever walked the earth, but he had some very nasty things to say to religious leaders of that day. And he says, see, and I'll just give you a piece of this. I don't want to read the whole thing because it's extensive. Really, all of Matthew chapter 23 are, you know, the first, at least the first 30, well, no, all of Matthew chapter 23. You can read it later. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 to 7, Jesus is saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, the lawmakers, the lawgivers, the law enforcers. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do nothing according to their works, for they say, and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all of their works they do to be seen by men. They make their flactories, that's their religious garb, their flactories broad and enlarge the borders of their garment. They love the best places at the feast and the best seats in the synagogue, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. That's what human religious leaders are like sometimes. They just love to be honored. They love to be elevated. You can see it sometimes. And sometimes you can see it in the cost of the suits that they wear. Or the name of the ministry that's being scrolled across the TV screen while they're preaching. The Brian Hemminger Worldwide Evangelistic Mem Ministry. Give now, and if you give to me, God's going to bless you. And I keep thinking, wait a second. If I give to you, God's going to bless me. Why don't you give to me and then God will bless you? There's a thought. Send me millions 
and God is going to bless you out of your gourd. I'll give you my address. Send it on over. Human religious leaders. Now, we've already talked a little bit about vanity and hypocrisy, but here's the net result of living under the traditions of men, and if you're a religious leader, teaching as authoritative the traditions of men. That's what Jesus calls defilement. In verse 15, there's nothing that enters a man from the outside that can defile him. He uses that word defilement. Listen to this. The definition of the word defilement from Greek, it is to make common, ceremonially unclean, or unholy. That's what it means to defile, to make common. I like that. That's interesting. To take, that means to take something that is uncommon and make it common. To take something that is ceremonially clean and to make it unclean. To make something holy and to make it unholy, that's defilement. But think about this for a second. Because what does Jesus do for you when he saves you? What does Jesus do for you when he causes you to be born again? He makes you uncommon, clean, and holy. That's what he does. John chapter 15, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. This is what Jesus does. He makes us uncommon. Look, if you want to be just like everybody else, don't ever be a Christian. If you want to be the most unique individual on the entire planet, be a Christian. Because God only made one of you. And the only way that you can be the person that God made you to be is to do it his way. So if you want to go do it your way, do your thing your way, you will never be the person that God made you to be. Because you cannot make yourself into the person that God made you to be. Only he can do that. And he is ready, willing, and able to do that when we surrender our lives to him. The point here is this, and I believe this is the point that Jesus is getting to. And that is that there's nothing, listen carefully, there's nothing that you can do to yourself that will make you unsavable. There's nothing that you can do to yourself to make you unsavable. Whatever it is that you do, Jesus can undo. You understand that? But think about this. He won't undo somebody that doesn't want to be undone. And we talk about this a lot here in this church because I think it's a really important point. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, what's God doing in my life? Well, the Lord's really doing some great stuff in my life, you know, and okay, that's awesome, far out, you know, but, but I want to talk about what the Lord's undoing out of my life. God's taking things apart. He's dismantling me so that we can get down to the part of me that he made. He's peeling back all the pieces of me that I've constructed for whatever reason I constructed them. Some of the things that I've constructed for myself, I've constructed as a defense against others. You know, I've created this persona. That's a good word for that. I've created this persona of who I am, and it's really not who I am, and God says that's not, that's not who I made you to be. So I'm going to take that completely apart. We're going to get down to the real you. So sometimes it's not a question of what God's doing in my life. It's a question of what God is undoing out of my life. Now look, if you want to worship a false God, you're free to do that. But if you want to worship the real God, this is what's going to happen. He is going to take you apart. Now, for me, and this is just me, you have to work this out for yourself. You have to decide whether you're okay with that. You've got to think about that. You've got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is who I am. But you also have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, is this who I want to remain? Because if I can look in the mirror and say, what I am right now, I want to remain the rest of my natural life, then you know God's got nothing for you. 
But if you can look in the mirror and say, you know what? I don't want to remain the person that I am right now. God's like, right on. Let's get to work. And he's kicking in doors and pulling up carpeting and throwing out furniture and doing everything that he can, everything that he will, and everything that you let him do, you got to let him do it. Everything that you let you, you know, I just had oral surgery here last week. I still got a mouthful of stitches. And they were doing some very delicate things. I won't explain it to you because I don't want anybody vomiting in their seat here tonight. But they were doing some very, very delicate things in there with knives and with needles and with stitches and stuff. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how that oral surgery would have gone if I was fighting them at every step? No, 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 you know. <laughs> Which might have been kind of what I did. I. <laughs> I tried, to, I tried to calm down. <laughs> my, yeah, my, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, when I go to the dentist, I, every time I go, I expect that they're going to strap my head down. They're going to lash my arms to the chairs, and they're going to belt me in. Because I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm always so freaky about that stuff. <laughs> so how much easier will it be on you and on the Lord, if you let him do what he wants to do. Friends, just, just let him do it. Just let him do it. And he's going to use all kinds of things to do it. He'll use your life. He'll use every circumstance of your life to take us apart piece by piece so that all that remains is the person that he made living in absolute surrender and reliance upon him. Just the way that he wants it just the way that life is meant to be. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everything goes hunky-dory, and it doesn't mean that uh, sometimes things aren't painful. Oral surgery is painful. It's uncomfortable. I don't like it. And sometimes the things that God does in our lives, they're, they're painful. Those of you guys that work with wood, Paul knows you work with wood. Sometimes when you're working with wood, you're working with a big, heavy rasp or you're planing, where you're taking off big chunks of wood. And then sometimes in the finish work, you're working with the absolute finest grit sandpaper you can possibly get, just to polish it, so you can rub your hand across, it just feels like silk. Sometimes God's working with the heavy power tools. Sometimes God's just polishing off to a nice fine finish. That's what he wants to do. So look, for you and for me, defilement only comes from what's inside. And that's where Jesus is working. He's working on the inside out. So ultimately, ultimately, defilement doesn't come from what you do. Defilement comes from who you reject. Think about that. Defilement doesn't come from what you do. People say this all the time. Well, you know, if you keep doing that, you're not going to go to heaven. You know, if you're a drug addict, don't go to heaven, you know. You know, homosexuals don't go to heaven. Adulterers don't go to heaven, you know. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. Who doesn't go to heaven are those that reject the free gift of eternal life in Christ. That's who doesn't go to heaven. So that means there's all kinds of people in heaven that you might not expect to be there. And the great thing about being born again, the great thing about surrendering your life to Christ is that he loves you so much, here it comes on, he loves you so much, he's not going to leave you that way. He is going to transform you from the inside out. So all of this other stuff, we don't really have to worry about it. He'll get to it, don't worry. Now, look, here's what Jesus says. And he says this in um, verse 14. It says that he called the multitude to himself. These are all the people that were there listening to this exchange. There's, there's the Pharisees there that are asking this question about why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands. There's Jesus, and there's this whole multitude of people standing around listening to this exchange between Jesus and this religious leaders. And I'm thinking, they're all standing there with their mouth hanging open. Because here, these are the religious, this, this guy teaches in my synagogue every single week. And here's this guy, Jesus, and listen to what he's saying to them. He just called them hypocrites. And I'm willing to bet that when he called those guys hypocrites, there were people in that crowd who said, 
I know they are. I know those guys are hypocrites. Now, I attended that synagogue no matter what. I went to that church no matter what, but I knew those guys were hypocrites. I knew it all along. And Jesus just told me it's true. <clears throat> so he gathers everyone to himself in verse 14, and he says, Hear me, everyone. Wow. Hear me. You know what that is? That's the voice of authority. That's the voice of authority. Six times in Matthew chapter 5, verses 22 to 44, Jesus says, well, you've heard it said this, but I say to you. That's the voice of authority. You know what he's talking like here? He's talking like he wrote the book. Oh. So he says, hear me, everyone, and then what? Understand. Hear me and understand. You know what this means? That word is an interesting word in Greek. It means figure it out, put all the pieces together, and think it through. Now, if there's one thing people do not do with the word of God and with their faith, is they don't do this. They don't figure it out, they don't put together all the pieces, and they do not think it through. They might come to church and get spoon-fed by the pastor. Oh, that's what I believe. Friends, you've got to think about this stuff. You've got to read it for yourself. You have to study it for yourself. You've got to think it through. If this is what the Word of God says, and I believe that this is the Word of God, if this is what the Word of God says, I have to do it. Or if this is what the Word of God says, I have to stop doing that. That's what I have to do. I don't have a choice. Because if I want to be the man that God made me to be, this is the pathway to that. So what am I going to do? Look, there are many, many, many who listen, but they don't hear. Because Jesus says here, verse 16, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. You know what that means? If you don't want to hear, you're not going to hear. Have you ever shared your faith with somebody and it just seemed like the words were just bouncing off a brick wall? It's because they don't want to hear. And you know what? If they don't want to hear, okay. They don't want to hear. I've got nothing to say to you. But that also means for you and for me, we have to couple his words with reason and understanding. We have to apply our brains. Remember what Jesus said it's the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is what we're, I was talking about earlier, Chris, is problem, solution, application, done. It's that little formula. I hate to keep bringing that up again, but it works for me because I'm a guy. And guys are fixers, right? Guys are fixers. But it works because if we know what the Word of God says, then we can apply it to our situation and find his resolution for the situation. If we do not, then I'm going to go berserk because I haven't taken what God has said and applied it. Now, if anybody wants to reject what Jesus says about all of these things, the traditions of man, man-made religion, if, you, if, if anybody wants to reject Jesus' words here, if they don't want to couple his words with reason and understanding, they're free to reject him. Anybody is free to reject Jesus and anything that he says. But if you do, then you have to be willing to accept the responsibility for that decision. You have to say, okay, I, I'm going to reject him. I believe that Jesus was a false teacher, a false prophet. You can't say that, that he was anything other than that if you don't believe uh, the things that he said because if he truly was a false prophet then the things that he said were outright cruel and deceptive. So if Jesus really is who he says he is and you reject that, well then, you know, that's that's the way that it goes. Cuz Jesus says here in uh, John chapter 12 in uh, starting in verse 42 yeah, verse 42, it says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. You see that right there again, that, that oppression by religious hierarchy? 
They wanted to believe in Jesus and they did secretly, but they didn't want their religious leaders to know it because then they'd be ostracized from their religious fellowship. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I don't care what anybody says to me. I don't care what anybody says about me. It really doesn't matter. I am supremely concerned about what God thinks of me and what God says about me. And then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in that last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. You reject Christ, you reject God. Simple. That's it. You just have to be willing to accept that, the consequences of that decision. Okay, then. So this whole question of defilement, oppression by religious hierarchy, traditions of men, where then is the issue here? What is the issue? What is the point of everything that we're getting down to? And it's in verses 17 to 23, and that is point number four, the trouble is inside. That's where the trouble is. Now, remember, it says, verse 17, when he entered the house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. In other words, they'd heard this whole exchange between Jesus, the religious leaders, and then Jesus addressing these multitudes. And, and when they got into private, they took him aside and they said, what the heck was that all about? See, their confusion, listen to me carefully, their confusion was based on the way that they were raised. See, these guys that Jesus just called hypocrites, they're religious. these were the religious leaders that had been teaching them since they were kids. They'd been going to this synagogue their whole life. And those religious leaders that we held in such high esteem, and we believed everything that they said, I mean, after all, they're priests, right? They're religious leaders. They're professionals, trained, right? They can't be wrong, so we were raised listening to what these guys had to say. We were raised believing what these guys told us. And now Jesus just owned them. Wow. So what, what do I do now? Now I'm confused. They had been raised with all of these traditions all of their life. And now Jesus, listen to this, Jesus is taking the religion that they'd been raised with and he's turning it upside down. How many of you were raised going to church? A lot of us were. Or with some sort of religious upbringing. And, and when you're raised with this stuff, it sticks with you. And even stuck with the Apostle Peter. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, the Apostle Paul rebuked him. Because when there were other Jewish believers around, Peter tended to hang more with the Jewish believers than the Gentile believers. And Paul rebuked him and said, what are you doing? We're all the same in Christ. You can't segregate yourself like that. Here's the point, and I've made it here before, and it's important to think about. And that is that you cannot drag your old religion into a new relationship with Jesus. Because some of what we were raised to believe is wrong. Period. It's wrong. And we have to remember that too when we're sharing our faith with other people. Because when we're telling them, you know, you need to be born again. You need to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. What we're asking them to do is we're asking them to abandon everything that they ever believed. When we tell them, this is how you worship God, we're telling them that the way that you worship God your entire life has been wrong. You, you're wrong. That's what we're telling them. We need to be careful with that. 
We need to be a little bit more gentle and we need to bring those people along a little bit more carefully because you're not going to get too far walking up to somebody and saying, you've been wrong your whole life and you're doing it wrong now and you need to get it right. That doesn't always go down real well. But the fact is you cannot drag your old religion into a new relationship with Jesus Christ. There may be some things that work. You know, I was raised going to church. I knew the Bible story. So, you know, when I got saved, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know all this stuff. I didn't really. And this example that he uses here about ceremonial washings and gifts to God and all of that stuff, it was a huge issue with these people at this time. It was their religion. Jesus is telling him, your religion is all hypocrisy and vanity. That was kind of intense. Jesus' explanation was graphic. Look at verse 18, or verse 19. Whatever it is that you put into your body, it just gets pooped out. <laughs> That's all that happens to it. Doesn't matter, you know, you could sacrifice this to any idol you want. But what does it become in the end? Poop. That's, that's, you know, I, I don't know what else to tell you. That, that's what it is. It's all just poop in the end. It was my grandfather, you know, when he, when he would pack his plate, he'd pile everything on top of everything. Do you ever have a grandfather that did that? Maybe you did that. My grandfather did that. I could have one pork chop on an empty plate. I could have 40 acres of empty plate with one little pork chop on it. And if I said, can I have some of those, that casserole? He'd pile it right on top of the pork chop. It doesn't matter how much empty plate we'd have. And then I, you know, I'd have to scrape it off because I, like, I, don't, I, like, I don't like my food to commingle. <laughs> that tells you something, doesn't it? But my grandfather, used to, I think because he used to mix all kinds of weird stuff together. I say, Grandpa, that just doesn't look good. And he says, ah, you know, he says it all comes out in the end. And I thought, well, I guess it does. <laughs> Now, Paul made a similar claim in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. And he was talking about everything that he had gained as a religious man. Before he knew Christ, he'd been a very religious man. As a matter of fact, he was a Pharisee. He was one of these Pharisees. And uh, he says, whatever it is that I gained, I count it all loss. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. For the excellence of knowing, or for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. If you're reading the King James Version, it says, dung. It's all just poop. Man's tradition, man-made religion. Another word that you can use there is superstition. Superstition. I don't want to go outside of the house without this special metal that I hang around my neck. You know, because if I hang that metal around my neck, I'm going to be safe from the boogeyman. Superstition. Look, the bottom line here, the heart of the matter is it's a matter of the heart. That's the issue. It's not about ceremonial anything. It's about the heart. And the heart is used in Scripture oftentimes, you know, to describe something other than just the blood pumping organ, right? It is defined in Greek as the seat and center of a man's personal life in which the distinctive character of the human manifests itself. Hence, the heart as the starting point of the developments of the personal life as well as the organ of their concentration and outgo. It is the seat of the desires, feelings, affections, passions, and impulses. That's a good definition, huh? That's how the heart is used in Scripture. So when Jesus refers to the heart, he is referring to the seat and center of all that makes you, you. Right? It is that place, the seat and the center of all that makes you, you, it is that place that Jesus aims at. That's where he goes, that's where he dwells, that's where he works. See, Jesus didn't come into your life just to clean up your behavior. 
He came into your life to transform you fundamentally at the deepest, most core level. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful. It's wicked. Who can know it? So when you're tempted to follow your heart, don't. Just don't. Because verse 21 and 22 tells you what comes from your heart. Here it is. There's 13 things here that come from your heart. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Follow your heart. That's where you're going to get if you follow your heart. You know, we were just up in the city, up in the Tenderloin. There's a lot of people that live up there that followed their heart. And that's where they ended up. See, the problem with man is man. I am my worst problem. I am. Spurgeon comments here, C.H. Spurgeon, great Victorian era preacher. He says, sin is not a splash of mud upon man's exterior. It is a filth generated within himself. Got that? Sin is not a splash of mud upon a man's exterior. It is a filth generated within himself. Uh, William Barclay adds here, Every outward act of sin is preceded by an inward act of choice. You got that? That's James chapter 1, by the way. Every outward act of sin is preceded by an inward act of choice. Therefore, Jesus begins with the evil thought from which the evil action comes. That's where Jesus works. See, he doesn't work with the behavior. He works with what motivates the behavior, the heart of the matter. That's where the trouble is. Now, God alone can work there. He's the only one that works there. There's no pill that can get there. There's no psychology. There's no meditation. There's no religious practice. There's nothing that can get there. Only God gets there to that spot, right where all of your stuff is. That's right where he goes. It's right where he lives. That, that door that you're trying to keep shut, you don't want anything or anyone to get in there. That's where he's going. And you can't stop him. He's terrible. Lord, don't go in there. There's too much pain in there. Oh, Jesus says, that's, yeah, that's exactly where I'm going. That's right where I want to step aside. That's where I'm going. You can't go in. Yeah, I can. The door's locked. I could, I could pick the lock. It's okay. Don't worry about that. You don't know what's in there. Yeah, I know what's in there. He's ready to go. So why do you think that Jesus takes up residence in our hearts? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. That's where Jesus dwells when we're born again. He moves in and takes up residence in our heart. In our heart. In this place. And that's right where the trouble is. And that's where he goes. The Apostle Paul understood this well. You can read about that in Romans chapter 7, verses 16 to 24. James adds on an explanation of the process of the thought that precedes the sin. In James chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. But David Guzik sums it up like this, and I'll close with this. He sums up like this. This is a powerful reminder that what God first wants from us is our heart. We can only really be changed before God from the inside out. If the life and the power and the work of God isn't real in our heart, then it isn't real at all. Don't look out. Look in, both for the diagnosis, the evil heart, and the treatment, salvation in Christ alone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're grateful not only for the diagnosis, but also for the cure. Not just the treatment, but the cure for all the evil that resides within our heart, all the fears, all the pain, all the dysfunction, all the evil desires, all of the mess that we create for ourselves. Jesus, that's where you go. And you are the cure. Lord, I thank you that you just don't want to treat our evil desires, you want to eliminate them from the heart. 
And Jesus, as scary as that might be for us, sometimes, Lord, we're not, or maybe it's just me, Jesus, it's, it, it's not so much the end result that I'm afraid of, it's the process. So I pray, Lord, that I would not be afraid of the process, that I would simply follow you wherever it is that you lead and allow you to do whatever it is that you want without fear, because I trust you. And I admit, Lord, I don't like it sometimes. But help me in that moment to trust you no matter what. As you work from the inside out of me. And I pray that that would be each one of our prayers tonight. It's in Jesus' name that we ask this. Amen.